Hello, Omar. Thanks for joining me today. Now, you're well known for your work in drug pricing and market access, but can you tell me a little bit more specifically about your role and what kind of projects you tend to get involved in? Um, yeah, I have two or three main roles. Um, my day job, I work in the NHS as a prescribing advisor to Surrey, Sussex NHS Trust. Um, there's about three or four facets to that, uh, mainly the managed entry of new drugs into the healthcare economy across Surrey and Sussex. Also, we look at implementation of NICE and national guidance, um, creation subsequently thereof for GP um, shared care guidelines of prescribing of new products. And, in, and increasingly now I'm doing some work with consultants and the new consortia and commissioning new pathways of care uh, which involve prescribing and other referral pathways, if you like, around disease management. That's sort of the latest thing. That's my job in Surrey. I also sit on NICE. My role at NICE is I sit on an external reference group for cost impact modeling, and that's basically looking at um, cost modeling of new interventions. It involves things like health utility, health disutility, um, looking at interventions and how they may um, impact on local health economies. Um, I also do some university lecturing and do some um, work. I do a fair amount of work looking at the roles and inter interplay between pharma, the NHS, um, and trying to you know, create a better working partnership um, within, within this current environment that's significantly changing. Sounds like a schedule that keeps you very busy. <laughs> Now, just looking at the UK, obviously everyone's talking about the NHS reforms and, and where we'll end up with this. So from your perspective, what kind of NHS structure do you think we will end up with? And who do you think will be the key payers with budgetary control? And what impact will that have on the prescribing process? Um, I Significantly, I can foresee a situation whereby we will have the consortia, which have already taken pretty much their formation and shadow form, the shape they're in, the PCTs will be gone by 2013. There will be no PCTs. Um, we will have potentially some regional support units for those consortia to help with some decision making. But what I foresee is very much a transactional based and, and I think in some instances commercial based support for the consortia who start outsourcing a lot of the special um, inputs, knowledge, informatics, and advice they need to run accordingly to run their healthcare, and so that will, um, you know, look like, you know, whether it's social organisations, if there's XPCT staff, some commercial units will also be involved with that. Okay. And one of the key terms which we hear a lot at the moment is value-based pricing. What yeah. do you define value-based pricing? Um, well, there's, there's, there's obviously like a definition or a terminology of what it means, and that there's a lot of debate about that, but how it takes shape is going to be quite critical. The whole aspect of value-based pricing is do the drugs we use, do they all give value to the, the NHS, and are they good value for money? Now, we obviously know that the pricing of drugs until now has been set at the PPRS for the last 50 years, and there's, you know, two or three annual reviews which look at how that pricing works. The roadmap to pricing is very different. And so how a drug company will arrive at a price is not really how the NHS calculates value. Because if you think about it, a pharmaceutical company will be looking at things like patient groups, return of investment, um, and various parameters around that. And some of the global scales and, you know, sort of economic climate and commercial viability for, for what they want to charge. For, the NHS doesn't calculate value like that. It doesn't look at the return of interest for pharma and see how to give the money back. It looks at what is a productivity gain within the health economy, what's the evidence base, what's the true innovation points, and it calculates value in a different way. And it's not surprising that we've seen uh, pharmaceutical companies offering products saying these are great value, and the NHS or NICE or SMC turning around saying, this doesn't show value for money. Our roadmaps are very different. How drug companies arrive at price and how we arrive at value, um, there doesn't seem to be a, um, you know, much overlap. And so what inevitably happens is a drug company will arrive at their price through 
some global economic decision-making process, but will then spend a lot of their time trying to prove its value in NHS terms. So although they didn't arrive at the price by looking at, say, reduction in hospitalizations, they will then spend a lot of time trying to convince payers that there is a reduction in hospitalizations and it does show good value. Value-based pricing, there's inception a lot of ideas that can go forward. And a lot of these ideas are around the base of reimbursement. And some of the countries that have already implemented this value-based pricing have taken, for example, models whereby when a drug comes for launch, the value generated to the patient or the healthcare economy is calculated. And the company is told, you can price it whatever you want. This is what we will reimburse. And we know specifically for countries like the UK, where because we're a price referencing country, although the sales in the UK may not be significant for a company, maybe 5%, maybe 10%, we know that the global sales of those countries that look at the UK may be more than 30%. So actually the banner price in the UK is critical for pharma. So they will obviously want to set the banner price as high as possible to ensure the sales to other countries that use the UK as a reference is not affected. That price may not reflect value to the UK economy, but it's not set representing value to the UK economy. It's set because the UK is a price referencing country. So in those countries where they've done value-based pricing and models in the UK that have looked at this could well set the inception date for something along the lines where an inhaler may come to market it might be priced in the UK at £70 a month. There will be national technology appraisals that look at the inhaler and say, you know, we have generics. You're the seventh in that class, nothing innovative there. And we don't think the inhaler may be worth more than £40 a month. So then there becomes a gap. The drug price is 70 The reimbursement from the government is 40 Who pays that difference? That's what value pricing could put into place. So it's really a further step, I guess, towards pharma losing control over the, what the price should be for its drugs and that being dictated by the individual countries and indeed, as you say, the value they present. Yes, I, think, I don't think pharma will ever lose control because if something like this system becomes implemented, does it mean that the pharmaceutical company will price down? I don't think it will. I think the price referencing aspect is so strong and it's so critical for farmers' global sales that they will still leave the price elevated beyond what the NHS calls value for money. So I don't think they'll lose control of the pricing. However, it's a different system where the reimbursement is not 100%. If the reimbursement is only 60% or 70% of the list price, the question then becomes who fills the gap? Who pays for the difference? Is it the GP? Is it these new consortia? Do we ask the provider units? Do we go to the patient and say, do you want to fill the gap? If patient choice is pushed to its extreme, that's what it becomes. If you want leather interior, if you want alloys, and you want a sunroof, this is, this is the price. And this has, I guess, particular connotations for the area of niche or rare diseases or indeed drugs for, for small patient populations within more common diseases, maybe end-of-life drugs. These tend to be more expensive, and it's going to make them less commercially viable, I guess, within this value-based pricing environment. So how does pharma deal with those particular areas? I think at the moment the system seems to be set up that technology appraisal and evaluation, you know, we are not genuinely told to give, say, for example, to lower the threshold for, a, say, an orphan drug. So if an orphan drug comes to market, we're not told, go easy on the appraisal, um, don't, don't give them a hard time on the p-value, and let's lower the bar for the evidence. Although we accept there may not be massive clinical trials, the, F, the, the value story still needs to be there. And it looks to me like the pay has been told, listen, the, the concession has been made at a higher level. The government might, for example, give a tax break or might give something towards patent or might give something towards some R&D license. So 
um, it looks to me the pay is not told to lower the bar for orphan or rare diseases. The pay has been told the government will look after that bit earlier on, on how these drugs get a license and maybe some conditions or tax breaks given to the companies that are pursuing this research. Having said that, under value-based pricing, um, there will be some added incentives brought into the mix where there is maybe true innovation. And there are three or four, if you like, brackets whereby price premium will be added if, for example, you're first to market with a new class or if, for example, you're treating a, either a rare disease or a disease that may have drugs that have very poor outcome, so still true unmet need. So there will be some premium here on price, there's no doubt about it. Um, but you're right in that you know, I don't think it's going to ask the payers to reduce the threshold for what they want. I think the numbers will be reduced, so I don't think we're expecting the big clinical trial numbers, I think it's fair enough, but the value story will still need to be there. So when you look at the pharma industry, what do you think it needs to do organizationally or structurally to put in place what it needs to demonstrate the right value for its medicines in this environment? I think a lot of this needs to be fixed earlier in the program development. So what do I mean by that? Well, when a representative comes to see me uh, for a new pain product, and it's a six-week placebo study. I'm not really that interested in a six-week placebo study. I don't routinely treat pain with placebo. The defense will often be, oh, this is what regulatory asks for. We have to do the study because of FDA, EMEA, so you just take your six-week study in placebo and see what you make of it. In truth and honesty, I want something head-to-head, -head, or I want to look at some validated pain scores or I want to see what the quality extraction is on a validated but, you know, quality of life. So really when these trials in phase two, phase three are going ahead and they are looking at what regulatory requirements are, companies are going to need to, and some of them have already started looking at, at that time, what are some of the payer outcomes needed in this area? What will the landscape look like? And can we add some bolt-on features to the clinical trial that we're doing to so that it doesn't just meet regulatory, but it also meets some payer outcomes and demands at that level? Otherwise, you've got a clinical trial that does fine with regulatory, but brings no value story to the payer. So you come to market, and, no, and you won't be on formulary. Now... You mentioned earlier one thing was that we could end up in a situation with value-based pricing where the value is set at a certain point, the price of the drug is actually higher, and obviously somebody needs to, to bridge that difference, and that could be the patient or the private insurer. Yep. So that's yep. generated some speculation that the UK system could be moving towards systems more reminiscent of, of Europe or even the US, where you end up mm. with different tiers and a lot more coverage by private medical insurance. Do you think that's mm. actually going to be the case? I believe in some form or other uh, my children and my children's children will be co-paying at the, at the front door for things that we currently pay for. I think that's going to happen. I think it's inevitable. Um, the current alternative is you're trying to put a stop on all new technologies. You're trying to pride the system on being free to everyone, but you're not giving them anything. That doesn't work for me, and it's certainly not working for patients. So the current system, the way it is, is nice, just sort of says no to everything. Um, no one can access the drugs they want, but we all say, don't worry, it's for free. Everything's free at the door, so pride yourself on that. I think people are getting tired of that. People are now saying, well, in other European countries, they can co-pay. What if I want to co-pay? What if I want to top up? I was at an interesting discussion, a debate, about a month ago at the King's Fund on cataracts. And the principles that apply, you know, whether it's a drug or a procedure, to do a cataract operation in the UK to save blindness cost about £700. To put the lens in, the actual lens itself is about 50 or 60 quid. Now, the lenses range from £50 up to more than £3,000. 
And of course, some patients are saying, well, apart from just going blind, you know, I might not want to get glasses or I might want to play golf and I want a lens that might cost £3,000 so I can go sailing. So where does medical need, preventing blindness, blend into, I want to help a patient go sailing and play golf? So a lot of patients, the RNIB were involved in this and a few other organisations, were actually saying, well, I want to co-pay. I want to top up. If, you're going to, if I'm going to go through the process of having eye surgery and you just want to put in a £50 lens, I want, to, I want the £300 lens. If the NHS doesn't want to pay for the £300 lens, why can't I pay for it? The current system doesn't really allow us to do that. The current system kind of says, listen, guys, the £50 lens is what is cost-effective. I can stop you going blind, so don't complain, and just put up and shut up with the £50 lens. I think medicine has just moved on so much that patients want more choice and some of them want to co-pay. And if I don't think a £2,000 lens is cost-effective, should I stop people paying for it? And my person, I don't believe we should. I think we should let them. So what you're saying is although there could be a cost implication, it's actually presenting patients with more choice than the current system does. Yeah, currently they don't have a choice. They get the £50 lens, because I tell them that's what they need. Just a final question, then. If we look beyond the UK, there's obviously all manner of different healthcare systems, which I'm sure you have good visibility of. Which other ones do you see as, as really effective models for healthcare and ones that the pharma industry needs to monitor very closely as they could be adopted by other countries? Um... There are a number of different healthcare systems and it's sometimes hard to observe as an observer to say which one's better or worse. But I think what's more important for pharma is to know the direction the UK is travelling in. There are about five countries in the EU, called the EU5, that are moving to a technology-based approach for new interventions. They're bringing in organisations like NICE and Germany has ICWIG and France has the HAZ system and I think Denmark and, and even some of the Scandinavian countries are looking to bring this in. I mean, we speak. I mean, I sit on NICE. Um, SMC is very influential in Europe. NICE is very influential in EU as well as the US. And so there are some EU countries that are bringing in value-based pricing, moving to technology appraisers like NICE and SMC. And I think that I don't think pharma can hide from this. I don't think they can say, uh, you know, I know some companies have said to me, well, Omar, we could just pull the plug from the UK, for example. Pull out the R&D, don't market there. You guys will be left with cheap generics. We won't get any new brands. Uh, that's true. Uh, companies could do that. I appreciate that. But you're going to do that in the whole of EU? The whole EU is moving this way. The whole EU is moving this way. It's going to start with this big EU5. By 2014... There will be five, six, seven EU states using value-based pricing. The rest who are not using it will probably model on it. I do a lot of work in Europe now and in the US on these technology appraisals and helping healthcare systems acquire these models. The other day I saw a drug decision made by the SMC and within less than 30 days, seven European countries, half of which didn't actually have a technology appraisal process quoted verbatim the SMC decision and subsequently affected the reimbursement policy. Pharma can't hide from this. They either kind of got to get with the game with the payer or they might say, we'll pull the plug from the EU. Not just the UK, we're not going to Germany or EU and we'll just go to you know, America and maybe the emerging markets. That could be the discussion. Maybe heading off to China and India where there is obviously significant growth. Um, but, you know, there were some issues around patent protection, which is another discussion topic. Well, on those thoughts, I'll uh, say thank you very much for your time, Omar. It's always fascinating to hear insights, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. PharmaForum.com is the dynamic online information and discussion portal for the pharmaceutical industry.